spirit over me like Washing you know. 
Virtual Science Pub. My name is Jane Affleck, and I am part of the outreach team here at OMSI. I will be your host tonight. I'm very excited to learn more about the cleanup of the Hanford nuclear site. OMSI is committed to sparking curiosity and igniting imaginations. To help everyone out at home, we've crafted and curated all sorts of engaging science activities and experiments to inspire you to experience the wonder of science from wherever you are. Visit omsi.edu for more information and resources. And if you do any of these science activities, please send us photos or videos so we can see what a great scientist you are. I hope you enjoyed tonight's pre-pub trivia and music by local Portland band Trinetti. They're currently scheduled to por- perform live inside OMSI's planetarium as part of our Kendall concert series on November 11th. You can find more information on our website. Putting on these live shows takes a lot of work. And we have an amazing partner that helps us to make this happen. A big thanks and shout out to Celestream for providing the live streaming services for tonight's Science Pub. We really appreciate your support. We're excited to welcome you back to the museum to experience body worlds and the cycle of life and to tour the USS Blueback submarine. Advanced tickets are required. The health and safety of OMSI guests and staff is our utmost priority. And we want you to feel comfortable and safe while at OMSI. 
to meet state guidelines and to help limit the spread of COVID-19, OMSI has implemented some changes throughout the museum. Please visit our website for more information. And OMSI is hosting our second virtual OMSI After Dark, celebrating Oregon beers. Tickets are $40 and include two beers, sorry, 10 beers, two tasting glasses and access to the virtual event, which will be held on Friday, September 18th from 7 to 9.30 p.m. You can, you can pick up your beer box at OMSI or have it mailed to you for $15, Oregon residents only. The virtual program will include science demos, brewery experts, live ice carvings, and more. Please visit omsi.edu slash brewfest for more information. And guess what? There's something you can do to support your local, local community. We have some outstanding food and beverage partners, and I would encourage you to put the pub back into science pub experience. So go ahead and order some delicious food and tasty beverages from one of our partners around the state. So tonight's event will look very similar to our regular science pub program. And for those of you who don't know what a regular science pub looks like, we're going to begin with a Hanford Hazards themed trivia game that is a warm up for tonight's talk. So grab a pen and paper and so you can participate. And then after that, we'll have a lecture by Ken Niles and Jeff Burwright. For the Q&A, you can submit your questions at any point during the presentation via the comments in our live feed. We will collect them all and after the lecture, I will ask your questions to the speaker. And if you enjoy tonight's lecture, please consider making a donation or purchasing a Science Pub pint glass. The link is in the comments section. But don't worry, there's no pressure to donate. Our mission at OMSI is to inspire curiosity by creating engaging science learning experiences for all people of all ages and backgrounds. So sit back, relax, and get ready for a great lecture. But right after our trivia. So this week, we have an educator from OMSI who will be joining us to play along with you at home. Please give a warm welcome to Jen Powers. Hi, Thank Jen. You. Thanks for joining us. Well, of course, I'm excited. Yeah, what are you looking forward to learning about tonight? Um, Pretty much everything, to be very honest. I don't know a whole lot about the cleanup of the Hanford site, and I'm, I'm just really excited to learn about their efforts. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, let's get started with our trivia then. Um, for those of you at home, you can grab a pencil or pen so you can play um, maybe against someone in your home. Um, I suggest you make it a little interesting, maybe play for bragging rights or who has to take out the trash, but um, try, to make it, try to make it fun. Um, there are 10 multiple choice questions. So Jen, I will read out a question and then I will give you some time to guess and then I will reveal the answer before moving on to the next question. Got it. Are you ready for the first question? Yes, I'm ready. Yes, okay, cool, let's get started. <laughs> okay, so number one, when this animal escaped from their pen near Hanford's F reactor in the early 1960s, they caused a bit of concern until they were recaptured. Um, what was it? A, rattlesnakes, B, alligators, C, tarantulas, or D, coyotes? Wow. Okay. Um, I don't think we have alligators in this region, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not choose B. Um, I really don't want it to be A, because if for all of you that know me, I am terrified of snakes, but because there is an amazing Liz Clamo uh, cartoon here with a rattlesnake, I'm choosing rattlesnakes. Okay, let's check yeah. out. <laughs> oh. No, alligators, that was the one that I was sure it wasn't. <laughs> Thank you, alligators. <laughs> the Department of Energy conducted a large range of biological uptake and radiological effects experiments on okay. a variety of animals such as salmon, alligators, and beagles. Who knew? All right. Well, I'm glad it wasn't rattlesnakes, but I'm <laughs> very surprised that it was alligators. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Let's go to question number two. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Which of the following have spread radioactivity at Hanford? A, fruit flies, B, rabbits, C, badgers, or D, all of the above? Has spread radioactivity. I, again, see, I would not choose badgers because I'm not entirely sure that that area has badgers. 
but I was thrown off by that. And I'm going to just go for the catch all and say all of them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Where are you going? Let's see what the answer is. All of the above. Nice okay. job. So the Department of Energy summarizes their finding of radioactive material that has gotten loose on the Hanford site about four times a year. This list includes plants and animals. Nice. Maybe. I love that radioactive badger picture we got there. That's good. <laughs> um, okay, let's go to number three. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Camp Hanford was home to about 50,000 construction workers during 1943 to 1945. They were fed in eight mess halls, each about the size of a football field. How much meat was used at the eight mess halls combined during a one week period? A, 75,000 pounds, B, 100,000 pounds, C, 250,000 pounds, or D, 500,000 pounds? Wow. Um, first of all, excellent photo choices once again. Um, once, once in here. I don't know. 50,000 people for an entire week. I'm going to go with 100,000 pounds of meat. Okay. A random question. <laughs> no. Oh, 250,000. Oh, so much. Wow. That's funny. <laughs> Um, okay. Let's That's see crazy. Number four. All right. I'm, I'm one out of three so far. I need to pick it up. <laughs> also a numbers amount. So, um, our numbers question number four, Camp Hanford workers consumed how much beer each week? So a 6,000 gallons or 512 ounce bottles, B 12,000 gallons or 1,012 ounce bottles, C 20,000 gallons or 1,666 12 ounce bottles, or D, 30,000 gallons or 2,500 12 ounce bottles? I just, they must have had a lot of beer. The, the most beer. <laughs> Almost 50,000 of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> B, 12,000 gallons or 1,000 12 ounce bottles. That's a lot. It is a lot. It's still a lot. All of that is a lot of bottles of beer. <laughs> um, Okay, question number five. Camp Hanford, A, was the largest voting precinct in the United States. B, had the largest general delivery post office in the world. C, had the world's largest trailer court. Or D, all of the above. Huh. Interesting. I have, I have no idea. I would assume that it doesn't have the largest voting precinct or general delivery post. So I'm going to go with C, except I feel like maybe they did have all of those things. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, all because of all those people, I guess, hanging out during the construction, huh? Pretty major. Eating all that meat and drinking all that beer. Okay. <laughs> Question number six. In 1993, a Hanford worker violated safety protocols by sticking the following high, sorry, by sticking the following into a high level waste storage tank. Okay. A, rock on a rope, B, a yardstick, C, a yo-yo, or D, his arm. Huh. I hope it's not his arm. I haven't guessed A in a while, so I'm going to go with a rock on a rope. Yeah. It's his arm, isn't it? I, I should just go with what I, ah, yes. Rock <laughs> just, on a rope. I should just guess what I don't think it is. That seems to be the uh, right way to go for this game. <laughs> nice job, though, Jen. All right. I love it. Rock on a rope. <laughs> okay, number seven. In 1990, an activist made jam from mulberries harvested near Hanford's North Reactor and sent jars to the Secretary of Energy and the Governor of Washington. The jam had an unusual ingredient. What was it? A, rat droppings, B, strontium 90, C, desert sand, or D, tumbleweeds? 
Um, considering we are about to have a lecture about um, nuclear energy waste cleanup, I'm going to go with B, strontium. Okay, let's see. Nice, B, strontium 90. So activist Norm Busk or Busk sent the jars with labels, do not eat. The jam contains 80 times the limit allowed for strontium 90 to be present in the food, resulting in the mulberry trees being chopped down by the DOE and incinerated. The cost to safely incinerate the trees, 200,000. Wow. That is a lot. There must've been a lot of trees. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to number eight. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> eight, the original eight graphite moderated plutonium production reactors used what type of containment? A, a steel dome. B, a steel reinforced concrete dome. C, a steel silo surrounded in concrete. Or D, none. Hmm. I feel like... I've, I feel like they're more like silos, but I'm not sure. But, but that's my guess, C. Okay, C, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> None. Oh, oh, what they use instead? Hanford's reactors had no means to contain radiation um, had an incident occurred. Pictured <laughs> above is the inside of the first production reactor, the B reactor. Wow. It seems like they maybe needed some protection. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number nine. How hot was water discharged to the Columbia River from the original eight graphite moderated plutonium production reactors? A, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. B, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we're gonna switch it up here. C, 95 degrees Celsius or D, 40 degrees Celsius. I'm going to try C again. Okay. Let's see. C. So yeah. the original eight Hanford reactors were cooled by 30,000 gallons per minute of Columbia River water that was discharged via pipeline into the bottom of the river at nearly boiling at 195 to 205 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the same as C. That is really hot. It's really hot. It's on fire. <laughs> Um, that's the graphic. Okay. And then the final question, Jen. All right. I'm ready. Gotten about half of them, right? Feeling pretty good. I'd be feeling good. Um, Hanford cleanup began in 1989. It should be completed when a next year B by 2020. So in the next few months mm -hmm. C, by 2040 or D by 2060 or later. I really want to say B because I would love it to be cleaned up now, but I, maybe it's going to take a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of dark by 2060 or later. Dang. Oh. That's a long time. <laughs> Poor skeleton. <laughs> Um, well, Jen, I, I think you did get about half right. So yeah. nice job. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well done, and thank you so much for joining us. Of course. I'm excited to see the lecture. Enjoy. Thanks, Jen. Bye. And for those of you who are at home, I hope you had fun learning something new about me. So now I'm going to introduce our speakers. So... We are going to have two speakers this evening, and we are going to begin with Ken Niles, who is an assistant director of nuclear safety at the Oregon Department of Energy. Ken manages Oregon's involvement and in cleanup at the Hanford nuclear site, the safe transport of radioactive material through Oregon, and emergency preparedness in the event of a nuclear accident. Ken joined the Oregon Department of Energy in July of 1989. Prior to that, he spent 11 years as a broadcast news reporter working in both radio and television. A native Oregonian, Ken earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Eastern Oregon State College in March 1992. Welcome, Ken, and take it away. 
Thank you, Jane. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining in tonight. Uh, we found through the years that uh, Hanford is a great topic to, uh, to discuss at a brew pub. It seems to be uh, go down a lot easier the information we share when people have had a pint or two. So uh, hopefully you're, uh, you're enjoying the evening and uh, can put up with uh, some of this information that we're, uh, we're going to share with you. So one of the things that I am often asked um, working for the state of Oregon is why do we care about Hanford? Because it is, after all, in Washington state. And it's really a simple answer. It starts with the Columbia River. Um, we all know the value of the Columbia River as for its uh, recreational value and its economic value and irrigation and agriculture and just really the spiritual value of the river. And if you look back at, especially during the operating years at Hanford, and you see some of the stark conditions of these facilities operating right along the banks of the Columbia River. And they did need the Columbia River water, as you found out in the, in the trivia. Um, and they did, um, they did influence the river's behavior in terms of uh, contamination. They did impact the river uh, pretty heavily back in the 1950s and 1960s. And the work we do uh, through the state of Oregon, through as well a lot of other people involved, Native American tribes and citizen groups and others, is to really make sure that the cleanup decisions that are being made today are protective of the Columbia River, not just today and tomorrow and a year from now, but into the future indefinitely. Just to orient everybody in terms of Hanford site and its location, it's located in southeastern Washington site it is a very large site, 586 square miles. It's roughly 20 by 30 miles in size. And when you get out there and drive the distances between the facilities, that's when it really begins to um, register with you in terms of how large this site really is. It's just north of the Tri-Cities of, of Richland, Kennewick, and Pasco. It, date back, it dates back to World War II. It was the first plutonium production facilities for the United States and in the world, uh, was part of the World War II Manhattan Project, and plutonium that was created at Hanford was used in the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, which we just recently passed the 75th anniversary. Hanford was chosen for a bunch of reasons. Uh, they needed the river water, first of all, to remove heat from the reactors, because those reactors, those nuclear processes generate tremendous heat, and they needed tremendous volumes of cool water to remove that heat from the reactors. They wanted a sparsely populated area because they, when they moved in, when the federal government moved in beginning in 1943 or 44, they moved out all the people that lived there, about 1,300 people, including residents of the two small towns of Hanford and White Bluffs. They needed a lot of electric power. Grand Coulee Dam had just opened a few years earlier. The area had a climate conducive to mostly year-round construction and an existing rail line, which made things a lot easier. What a lot of people don't realize is before they chose the Hanford site as the site that they did, they looked at other sites around the Pacific Northwest and in the Western United States, including a couple of sites in Oregon. So we're, uh, you know, it's bad enough it's on the Columbia River, at least it's not within our state, what they did there. It really ramped up in terms of, of going from nothing to this massive construction project in a very, very short period of time. It took 14 months to build the first nuclear production reactor. No one had ever built anything like that, that size and scale and magnitude and complexity, 14 months. They built three reactors during the war, uh, fuel fabrication facilities, two chemical processing facilities, and that's the picture you see there of one of those chemical processing facilities under construction, support facilities, machine shops, laboratories, and they built a town just for the construction camp workforce. Again, about 51,000 residents at its peak in June of 1944. You've already seen a little bit uh, in terms of the mess halls and the, just the the needs of so many workers in such a short time. So all this stuff they were building, they also had to build a place for themselves to live. What was really interesting 
is that very few of the workers at Hanford knew what they were doing, knew what the end goal was. Uh, it was a super secret site. And even the, the congressional member for that part of Washington state didn't know what was going on. So you had mechanics and machinists and iron workers and laborers and a lot of other people that are just knowing the small piece of what they're doing, connecting uh, wires to this or, or uh, building cement foundations and things like that. Most people had absolutely no idea what they were working on. And if they speculated with their coworkers, there were also FBI agents undercover and those people would be shuffled out very quickly if they started talking too openly about what it was they might be doing. It wasn't until the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in August of 1945 that the truth was revealed. This is the, the villager, which was basically the, uh, the newspaper for the site. President Truman announced we had dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Even though the bombs were different, Hiroshima used enriched uranium, which was uh, fabricated in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. They still did talk about Hanford was also involved in this effort to develop atomic bombs. And then again, three days later, the plutonium fueled bomb dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. The peak operating years for Hanford, really the late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, there were a number of expansions during the Cold War years, era. They added six reactors to the three built in World War II. And at one point, as many as eight of the reactors were operating at one time. Hanford basically produced plutonium for America's nuclear weapons program for 45 years. It was America's primary source of plutonium. The 74 tons of plutonium it produced was about two thirds of what was made in the, company, or in the country. There was another site in South Carolina that was built beginning in the 1950s called the Savannah River site that produced the remainder of the plutonium for our nuclear weapons program. I'm gonna take you through just a, a really quick description of what it was they did at Hanford. So what that worker is holding is a machined piece of uranium fuel, which was manufactured in the Southern end of the site called the 300 area. We're gonna come back to this map several times. Again, roughly 30 feet, from north to south and roughly 20 feet, or 20 miles, excuse me, and 30 miles uh, east to west. So the fuel was fabricated in the 300 area. This is what it looked like before cleanup began. Uh, a lot of different buildings, that dome was a test reactor. Um, the areas that look like disturbed earth in the kind of the middle and the upper middle of the, of the uh, picture were burial grounds for the waste that they generated. And again, you can see right along the Columbia River. Because of the weight, the uranium fuel was shipped around the site by rail. And it was taken to one of the reactors. There were nine reactors eventually built at Hanford. This is the face of one of the reactors. This is a worker at the face. So the, the fuel was inserted uh, horizontally into the reactor pushed into the middle of the reactor where the nuclear uh, fission occurred. The reactors were all located on the Columbia River because again, they needed that, that cooling water to remove the heat. So nine reactors in six different areas along the Columbia River. After a period of time, after while the nuclear processes were occurring within the reactor, small amounts of that uranium is turning to plutonium and other elements as well. After a while, the fuel is pushed out the back of the reactor into a pool of water behind the reactor. By this time, the fuel is now very radioactive. Uh, it's gathered by workers using long handled tools. The water acts as a radiation shield for them. The fuel is put into these baskets. It's then put back into the shipping containers on the train and then it's moved to the center part of the site for processing. There it was taken to one of the canyon facilities, uh, a chemical processing facility, where it was initially dissolved in nitric acid. Then it went through a series of different chemical processes to extract very small amounts of plutonium 
um, from that fuel. This was the final stop at Hanford. This was not built during World War II. It was added a few years later called the plutonium finishing plant. And this was the final product. This is a called a plutonium puck. Uh, and you can see actually the worker is holding it in his hands. Uh, it is in a plastic bag. The type of radioactivity that it contains does not penetrate well. So even keeping it in that, that, uh, that bag with the, the worker with his gloves, that can contain it. Other types of radioactivity, of course, do have uh, very strong amounts of penetrating radiation. So that's what they did at Hanford. They did other things as well. They did research and animal experiments and a lot of different things. This was their primary mission, produce plutonium for America's nuclear weapons. The problem is, the, the reason we're still talking about it today and still concerned today, is it created enormous amounts of waste, liquid waste and solid waste. This is a desert and they created so much liquid waste that they had various ways of dumping this liquid waste into the soil. The intent was that it would percolate down into the soil column. The center of the site there, it's a couple hundred feet above groundwater. Uh, eventually, it broke through to the groundwater in numerous places. They estimated once the cleanup began that during production years at Hanford, they dumped over 444 billion gallons of contaminated liquids into the soil at Hanford. They also created obviously huge amounts, huge volumes of solid waste, uh, which was just dumped into burial grounds. Some of it was like industrial trash and really not that hazardous. Some of it was highly radioactive. Through the 70s, through the 60s and 70s, they began to scale down operations. They shut down basically one reactor a year from 1964 to 1971. At the time, the government decided that additional weapons grade plutonium was not needed. And they, they kind of went through the 1970s with very limited operations to just one reactor Purex, which was the processing canyon, was shut down for safety improvements and overhauls for a period of 11 years. So not much happening in terms of plutonium production in the 1970s. Then during the um, early 1980s with the Reagan administration and a buildup of our nuclear weapon um, forces, Hanford went back into high gear, producing a lot of plutonium, even with that one reactor and that one uh, processing facility until we reached the point in 1988 when the Secretary of Energy, John Harrington, told a congressional subcommittee that we are, quote, awash in plutonium. And that marked the end of plutonium production, both at Hanford and Savannah River. And over a period of a few years, it really turned not just those two sites, but dozens and dozens of other sites around the country that had some piece of nuclear weapons production turned them all from production mode into cleanup. So the transition to cleanup was a little bit awkward uh, under pressure from the state of Washington, the US Department of Energy, which owns and operates Hanford, signed a cleanup agreement May 15th of 1989. So we're 31 years plus into the cleanup. The goal was to reach compliance with environmental laws. Everyone understood Hanford was way out of whack in terms of uh, its environmental compliance. 31 years ago, they envisioned about a 30 year cleanup. They had a schedule, they knew there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, they thought they'd be a lot farther along at this point in the cleanup. And the cleanup was a little slow to get started in some ways because there was also, I will call it a distraction of the local communities and others really concerned about the future economic um, viability of the area if production shut down. They did not see that cleanup was a long-term answer in terms of helping the community economically. And so there was a, a fight that lasted about 10 years of trying to get new production missions. But in the end, none of those came to Hanford. And cleanup, as it turns out, was more than enough sufficient to support the area financially. So let me take you back to 1989 and give you an idea of the scope of the, of the mess. 
that awaited the cleanup. Because when you talk about Hanford, you're talking about a variety of different chemicals, a variety of different radioactive materials in all kinds of different forms. So I mentioned earlier, they had dumped this enormous amount of liquid waste into the soil. There was one waste stream that they knew was, was really too toxic to just dump into the soil. And they built underground storage tanks and they put that waste in those. And when they filled up, they built more. And when those filled up, they built more rinse and repeat numerous times. Um, at the start of cleanup in 1989, there were very quickly some very serious and immediate safety issues identified with the tanks uh, in terms of explosive risk and fire risk, uh, criticality risk, um, just a lot of things that, that took a lot of years to resolve and also um, had an implication in terms of slowing down the cleanup in terms of the tank waste because these immediate safety issues first had to be dealt with. There were hundreds of liquid waste disposal sites on the site and disposal was still ongoing. So we started cleanup, but the mess was still getting bigger and broader. Some of the fuel, they did not process to remove the plutonium. Instead, they stored it at, in basins at two other reactors. Um, and as you can see over time, the fuel started corroding. Uh, this was just a quarter mile from the Columbia River and Fairly soon in the cleanup, one of, uh, one of our staff at the Oregon Department of Energy started asking questions about earthquake vulnerability of these basins. And the US Department of Energy looked at it a little bit and agreed, and it became one of the, one of the top cleanup priorities around the DOE complex. Because the concern was an earthquake might rupture the basins, drain the cooling water, expose this material to the air. And if it came in contact with the oxygen in the air, it was pyrophoric and it would start burning and you would have plutonium or uranium rods burning with plutonium among other things being strewn throughout the countryside. So again, a big focus as well early on. When they shut down production in Hanford, they didn't do it all that orderly. Uh, these are very complex facilities. And instead of stopping what was going in and allowing things to clean out, they basically stopped things in place. And so there was in this one facility, the plutonium finishing plant that I showed you earlier, they estimated 18 tons of plutonium and plutonium bearing material in all kinds of different forms, some that were really not conducive at all to long-term storage or long-term safety. All that liquid waste that they disposed to the groundwater or to the soil eventually did contaminate an enormous amount of groundwater, about 80 square miles of groundwater. And you can see by this picture, a lot of it was entering the Columbia River. Some still does, a lot less than back then. Again, all the solid waste. If you look at the hundreds of disposal trenches they dug at Hanford and put them all end to end, you would have about 43 miles of these disposal trenches. So think about the freeway from Salem to Portland, basically, two lanes of freeway, that's how much volume there is within these, these uh, different burial grounds on the site. You got all the contaminated facilities, of course, the plutonium production reactors, the chemical processing facilities, you had laboratories that had fires and accidents during its operational years, some heavily contaminated. The good news is there actually has been a lot of good news. You know, we hear about Hanford usually when the news is bad, uh, but there have been a lot of things that have gone well in terms of progress at Hanford. Still a lot more to do, and we'll definitely focus on that. But let me just give you a little bit of highlight of what has been accomplished uh, at Hanford so far. The date is really when these things were accomplished. And if you think back again, 1989, the start of cleanup, you can see how long it took. And it, it, for the most part, there were very good reasons why it took so long. The complexity, uh, the, the environmental processes, the regulatory processes of identifying the hazards, potential solutions, building and permitting facilities, and then beginning to make the problem go away. So they stopped the dumping of radioactive contaminated liquids uh, to the soil in 1997. They built treatment facilities. They stopped production within some of the laboratories and things like that. 
The tank safety issues also very complicated, um, but they eventually resolve those. So the risk of a hydrogen explosion or other things like that, um, not zero, but way less than what it was back in the early 1990s. That spent fuel in storage near the Columbia River, they were able to repackage it, they dried it, they moved it away from the Columbia River to an interim storage site in the center of the site in a much safer storage configuration. And then it took another 15 years to gather up all the sludge to design the containers because those generate a lot of hydrogen gases to design that and move that safely as well away from the Columbia River. So that's all been done. Here's an example of just the, the type of work environment for some of these jobs at Hanford. This is the spent fuel basin and you can see the level of protective clothing that people need to wear. And you think about, again, this is a desert. It gets hot in the summer, cold in the winter, and these people are wearing all this different clothing. They were able to stabilize the plutonium in the plutonium finishing plant. Again, took a long time to do that and successfully moved it off site. The federal government chose Savannah River site, although South Carolina is not all that happy about the decision, but all the plutonium from Hanford was moved to that facility in uh, 2009. The groundwater treatment processes at Hanford is really one of the bigger um, cleanup successes at Hanford. They've not eliminated the, the contaminated groundwater, but they've contained it. They've shrunk the size of the plumes. They've reduced the concentrations. They have a number of groundwater cleanup systems, mostly pump and treat. So they put an extraction well into the groundwater table. They suck up the water, run it through treatment processes, remove the contaminants, and then re-inject that, that water. Here's an example just of, of you can see some of the, the progress. So this is the north end of the site uh, by three of the reactors, two on the left, one on the right, at what's called the Horn of the Columbia River. That blue and the yellow and, and gray uh, is contamination of hexavalent chromium. So that was the the material that was such a problem in the Aaron Brockovich movie and what happened down there. It was used at the reactors uh, to purify the water. It was disposed of, leaked. They had problems at every one of the reactors with hexavalent chromium. But you can see over the years with that pump and treat, they have been able to pull those plumes for the most part away from the river, which is the gray. They've shrunk the size of those plumes and they've shrunk the concentration. So it's a, it's a very slow process. It will take a long time to clean up the groundwater, but it's been one of the bigger successes that they've had there. They've dug up soil, contaminated soil from near the Columbia River and it's important to note that in turn, when you're dealing with radioactive material, you can't really change the properties. If it's, if it's radioactive and hazardous for a thousand years, you can't make it less than that. It's still a thousand years. What you do is you can change the form from a liquid to a solid. You can dig it up from an environment right along the Columbia River like they did there and put it into a engineered disposal site where it will be much safer. It's still radioactive, but you can get it into a situation where it isn't a risk to the environment or to people. They dug up dozens of burial grounds, some incredibly complex um, with a lot of things that they weren't necessarily anticipating based on the records that they had. They've demolished a lot of buildings, uh, some very heavily contaminated ones. All that waste along the Columbia River that they dug up that contaminated the soil and the building rubble from the demolition had to go somewhere. And so they built this massive uh, disposal facility on the site. It's not quite as remote as it looks from that view. If you were looking the other way, you'd see a lot of the other Hanford facilities, but it's a, it's a enormous facility that they expand as they go. So on the far right, they finished that a long time ago and they're moving to the left and they can continue to expand as needed out to the left. They've cocooned six of the nine reactors. So they put them into a safe long-term storage. Two more to go. One will not be cocooned because it has been turned into part of a national park. 
this has been one of the more recent um, successes at Hanford was the completed demolition of the plutonium finishing plant. This was an enormously contaminated facility and it didn't go all that well. They had uh, a number of, of incidents where they had contamination spread off site during the demolition, had to stop work a lot. Uh, it took them years and years and years to clean out the inside to where they could begin to demolish the exterior of the facility. And again, you can see the protective clothing they needed. There was one room that was so heavily contaminated with uh, a material that is very flighty and, and very much um, uh, internal hazard called americium. They had a chemical explosion in a glove box back in the 1970s, horribly contaminated a worker uh, who did survive and a room. And they basically, for the most part, just welded the door shut and moved on. But to demolish that building, they had to get in there and clean that out. And so they started using these kind of moon suits. And uh, I was fortunate to be there one day when they were trying them out. They'd never used these at Hanford. They'd used them at a, another facility, a Department of Energy facility in Idaho. And so I was there when the workers were trying them on. They were talking to the, the representative of the company, figuring out how they would work. You, you can see all the, the gloves and the tape and things that they need, all the, all the manpower it takes just to get somebody suited up and ready to go. So you can see he's all suited up inside this bubble suit that goes on over him. So he's got a respirator and then they put on the bubble suit. And one of the main advantages of this is that in previous attempts to clean out this room, they had to have supplied air. So they had the equivalent of a scuba tank on a person's back, which weighs about 30 pounds, which adds to the heat stress of the worker, which makes it a lot shorter period of time that they can be in there doing the work they need to do. With these, they have a hose that tethers to the suit, and it not only provides them air to breathe, it also provides cooling air, so they're able to work much longer. So this is the first time this guy's ever had this suit on. He's worked in contaminated environments with other suits, but never had that before. He went into a room, which is a mock-up of whether we can bring up and just started out doing some really simple things, picking things up, cutting things. And then a few months later, here's actually, here's how they, they exit that. So he is facing towards a contaminated room. He would back up. The people out here would be dressed in protective clothing as well. You can see an arc on his back. That's an area that was taped. So they'd remove the tape, which gave them a clean area to cut. They would cut that. He would basically take the suit off, and now we're looking at the other angle, drop it into the contaminated room, and then step back. And these folks would work in teams of four. So worker number two would then gather up that suit, put it in a waste barrel. It's now radioactive waste, one-time use only. Here they are a few months after training began, the first time into that room. And you can see just really how smooth they start moving around with these. So all that training in a clean environment paid off to allow them to work pretty well and pretty comfortably in this very, very horribly contaminated room. So here's what the plutonium finishing plant and its support facilities looked like at the beginning uh, during demolition. Uh, it was a long haul. Again, they had problems with some contamination spread. It is now, this is not the most recent picture, it is all now leveled. There are still some rubble piles that need to be removed. Uh, COVID has it had an impact at Hanford because of all the protective clothing and gloves and masks and things they wear that they were losing access to their normal suppliers. So a lot of the work at Hanford was stood down, but this was getting this plant down to the, to the foundation was, was a big accomplishment. A little different version of the map. So the gray area is really uh, areas that were not part of the production. They were very lightly contaminated with, with more traditional things like motor pools and, and uh, barracks and things like that. The green area is where they have focused the cleanup for the last uh, very long time. The brown is not quite as contaminated as that ugly yellow in the middle. And that's where they're going to be focusing cleanup the rest of the way they have to go. 
So remaining challenges, and there are a lot, and I'm going to go through these really quick because it's about time to turn it over to Jeff. So the unexpected. Um, COVID was definitely an unexpected, and it basically shut down work at Hanford. It slowly began to ramp back up, but it had a significant impact on cleanup at Hanford and will have an impact on when some of these projects get done. The unexpected in terms of what they found, initially they didn't know where all the waste was buried. Uh, and sometimes they found some things that the records didn't really show should have been there. And sometimes they knew something was gonna be there and it really was different and much more hazardous and much more volatile. So a lot of unexpected. Fires are an unexpected hazard. There have been two times that a major portion of the site has burned since 1989. And in this case, you can see it threatened some of the major facilities. Now those concrete facilities aren't gonna burn, but some of the support buildings, some of the waste sites that are covered with grasses, they did burn and it did spread some contamination. Here's, uh, I think this is Rattlesnake Mountain. I think the mountain itself has burned four or five times since cleanup began. Um, and then sometimes some unexpected things well as well. So this is the, uh, the Purex facility. They, as they had large equipment in there that failed, could no longer be used. They put it into tunnels, which you see at the bottom right corner, there are some tunnels, basically trenches with a cover. They put these materials, very highly radioactive materials in there um, on rail cars. And three years ago in May, one of these partially collapsed. And it was a big deal because there was very highly radioactive material inside uh, and people responded and the media responded and the bloggers responded. It, it was not, as it turned out, much of a health risk because that material that was within those, uh, those tunnels was really fixed for the most part to those large pieces of equipment. They covered the tunnel interimly. There's two tunnels. The first one is the one that collapsed. You can see the longer second one and they've since filled both with grout to stabilize them, to make sure there isn't any additional collapses until they can figure out what to do with the material in these. Uh, this is a, a facility called the Z9 Crib. It's where they dumped a lot of plutonium rich liquids. Uh, there's 18 feet of air between the ground you're seeing there and the roof. And it's right at the top of the list in terms of potential other mishaps that occur that could occur at Hanford if the roof were to collapse. They're talking about interim stabilizing this with grout as well. Cleanup funding is a big, big deal. It's uh, Hanford side gets about two and a half billion dollars a year uh, and has for a number of years. We all know, you know, with, with COVID especially and the economic situation, uh, we have no idea what the federal budget is going to look like in the next few years. Uh, in 2016, they compiled a report that looked at how long and how much it would cost to complete the cleanup. And they came up with a total of $107 billion. That's in addition to the 40 or so, 45 they've already spent. Three years later, a lot more detailed look at what they had to do. And here was the result. Instead of 107 billion, you're up from to 300 to 600 billion uh, with cleanup maybe running into the 2100s. And that variance is really because of what will happen with, or what may not happen with the 54 million gallons of high level waste. And Jeff Wright is gonna tell you all about that. Okay, thank you so much, Ken. All right, now we're gonna introduce Jeff Burright. So Jeff joined the Oregon Department of Energy in November of 2017. He brings prior experience providing technical decisions, supports for complex federal nuclear remediation projects around the country, as well as knowledge of radioactive waste management at the national level. Jeff is focused on issues surrounding the retrieval and treatment of Hanford's high-level radioactive tank waste. Also a native Oregonian, Jeff holds a BA in English and an MS in Marine Resource Management from Oregon State University. All right, take it away, Jeff.
Okay. Uh, hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeff. My job here tonight is to talk to you about one of the biggest messes that we have ever made as a species, uh, to talk about how we have managed that mess over the last 75 years, and then to talk about the actions that we're taking now to try to figure out how to clean up this mess so that it will last uh, long into the future. And as Ken mentioned, um, I am talking about the tank waste at Hanford. Uh, this quote here is from U.S. Representative Doc Hastings from 20 years ago, so a bit of perspective. At that time, he remarked that the treatment of the high-level waste at Hanford remains the single largest environmental cleanup initiative in the world, and any delay could jeopardize the safety of the residents of the Pacific Northwest. And if he could only see today that the, the challenge has only gotten bigger and the cost of delay has only risen. And we're gonna get into that. But first, some fast facts about the tanks. Uh, as Ken mentioned, there are 54 million gallons of high-level radioactive waste uh, spread across 177 underground storage tanks on site at Hanford. Uh, there are 149 single shell tanks. The first one was built in 1944 and has held waste for over 73 years. Uh, and then there are 28 what are known as double shell tanks or a tank within a tank. Uh, the oldest one of those was 1968. The most recent was 1986. So the point that I wanna get across here is these tanks are old. Uh, some other facts that I wanna bring out here. In the single shell tanks, you have a little over half the waste uh, the tanks themselves ranged in size from about 55,000 gallons to uh, a million gallons. And this number fluctuates over time, but at the time I was producing this uh, presentation, there were 67 known or suspected leaking tanks. And there was just another one that came across uh, about a week ago. Um, so it, it's still a, a changing situation as time goes on. Uh, there were also the 28 double shell tanks. Those were much larger. Uh, on, on the whole, uh, ranging from a million to 1.2 million gallons. Uh, and we have lost one of those, uh, happened about eight years ago. And, and I'll get into detail on that. Let's, uh, let's talk about the tanks. Let's focus on those first. So again, to reorient or to orient us, um, you can see there the Hanford site in Washington. Uh, this image shows the Columbia River there along the north side. Uh, the reactors you can just see right along the edge of the river there. The blue box delineates uh, what is called the central plateau on site. And the yellow area is where most of the uh, processing occurred. It's where the tanks are, as well as the waste treatment plant, which I'll be talking about tonight. That plateau is about 200, 250 feet above an aquifer that flows toward the southeast. And it's about seven miles from the eastern edge of the tank farms to the Columbia River. So that aquifer eventually does enter the Columbia River. Uh, here you can see in a bit better detail, uh, those 177 tanks were clustered into what are known as farms. So you have the red, which are the single shell tanks, and then the teal that are these double shell tanks uh, in various locations around the site, sometimes miles apart because it was wherever it was convenient where they needed some liquid storage at the time. This here, I want to show you just to get a sense of scale. You can see the people uh, on top of that tank as they were building it. This is one of the half million gallon tanks. So the biggest tanks were more than twice this size. These things were huge. Here's another sense of perspective here. Uh, about the size of a basketball court and 49 feet high. Uh, and I think this, yeah, a million gallon tank, very large tanks. Uh, here for another dose of perspective is what it would look like if you were standing inside one. Uh, this is when it was being built. And you can see that there are those penetrations along the top of the tank. Those were the access points um, where they had risers for mixing the waste or transferring the waste, uh, those kinds of activities. Here I'm going to take you on a, a series of, of photographs that show uh, the process of building a tank farm. Starting in 1944, what they did was they, they dug a big hole uh, about 50 feet deep. Next, they laid down concrete base mats uh, upon which they were going to uh, build the tanks themselves. Uh, 
here you can see they've started to build the tanks in what's known as a kettle style where they built the sides and then they added the dome later. And these are made of carbon steel and that'll be important later. Here you can see they've started to add domes to the tanks. And here you can see towards the back, they've already encased some of the tanks in a concrete shell. Um, and again, these are single shell tanks from the 40s. So the process is still ongoing. Here they've completed encasing them all in concrete and they've started to fill them in with dirt to provide radiation shielding from the contents inside. Here they're just about finished. And then there is a completed tank farm. Uh, you would barely know it's there. And then, as I mentioned before, starting in the 60s, they began to build double shell tanks. Uh, similar basic concept, the main difference being that it had two shells. It was a tank inside a tank. So you had the base mat, there was an insulating refractory, which is kind of like a trivet for a hot plate because these tanks would get very hot from the waste inside that was highly radioactive and, and generating a lot of heat. And then you had this annulus space in the middle and an important thing to note here is that uh, by state standards, if you lose the inner shell of the tank, then the tank is no longer fit for service. So it really is there to provide an additional layer of security to prevent the contents of the tank from getting uh, into the ground. Here's a picture of a double shell tank being constructed. Uh, it's interesting to note that as they were constructing these tanks, often they would find that there were uh, failed welds that had to be redone. Uh, and sometimes these had been out in the weather for a long time. And so you, some of the natural corrosion processes from being wet would have a chance to begin. So there was just a real human element to the construction of these tanks that can sometimes have an impact decades down the road. Along with all the tanks came miles and miles of pipelines. Uh, for just one of the tank farms that was recently uh, emptied, they estimated about seven miles of pipelines just for that one farm. And these pipes were there to convey waste from tank to tank, to move, tank, to move waste out of the tanks and into the processing facilities and vice versa. And occasionally they would have a, a pipe that would clog, uh, just like an artery. And they would try to work out the, the uh, obstruction there. And if they couldn't do it, well, they would just abandon that pipe in place and they would make a new pipe. So there are some of these pipes around the site that have an unknown amount of waste still in them today. Now that we've talked about the tanks, uh, next I wanna talk about the waste inside the tanks. High level radioactive waste is a pretty specific term. Um, and to help illustrate what it means and what's really in the waste, first, just really quickly, I need to teach you all how to make uh, weapons grade plutonium. So don't, don't spread this around. Um, as Ken mentioned, uh, the radioactive or the, excuse me, the uh, uranium fuel was uh, put into reactors along the river and left to essentially to bake for a couple of weeks. And while the fuel was in the reactor, there were um, uh, neutrons flying around out of the uranium and occasionally it would hit one of its neighbors. And sometimes that would then split the uranium in half and that was fission. And that would create a ton of heat as well as radioactivity, and then it would fire off yet more neutrons. And so you would have a chain reaction of all these bits flying around. And occasionally what would happen is a, an atom of uranium would absorb a neutron and, and transform from uranium-238 to plutonium-239, which is what we were all after at the time. The problem is, it was, as Ken mentioned, just a very small proportion of the total amount of fuel that you had irradiated. It's estimated that for every ton of uranium that they put through the reactors, they could extract about a pound and a half of plutonium out. So how did you do that? Well, first, every uh, piece of the fuel had a had an aluminum can around it, essentially, which prevented it or uh, protected it from corrosion when it was in the water. So you had to dissolve that aluminum can in a highly caustic solution. So they would dip it in there, 
dissolve the aluminum can, and now you have just the uranium. Well, then you had to dissolve the uranium, and they would dip it in nitric acid and dissolve the uranium and all of those fission products that had been torn apart and, and just that little, little bit of plutonium into this really nasty acidic soup. And then they would transfer it to the uh, chemical processing facilities and they would introduce, uh, they use five different processes over the decades, but usually what they would do is add different solvents to help separate the waste layers so that then they could skim the plutonium out of the, the whole solution. So once they had done that, you've taken your pound and a half of plutonium out, all the rest of that liquid, all the rest of that dissolved fuel, that's waste. And as Ken mentioned, a lot of the, um, we'll call it less bad for lack of a better term, the less bad stuff, they would just discharge directly to the ground. But the worst of the worst stuff, the stuff they didn't really know what to do with, that they sent to the tanks until they got a better idea of what to do with it. Uh, and then over time, as water in the waste uh, evaporated, as, um, oh, another piece here, because the tanks were made of carbon steel instead of, of stainless steel, and they had just poured a bunch of acid to dissolve the uranium, one of your natural concerns is that the second you put this waste into your tank, you're going to eat right through it. So they had to add a bunch of extra chemicals, uh, namely sodium hydroxide, to change the chemistry of the waste from a highly acidic solution to a highly basic solution. And as part of that process, you would then have parts of the waste that would precipitate out and settle to the bottom. And here you can see some of these images from inside these tanks over time. What we have today in the tanks can be generally classified into three different types of, of waste. You have the supernate there in the middle, which is just liquid. Uh, often that is water containing uh, soluble radionuclides, sometimes organic solvents. You have the salt cake, uh, which is uh, largely from the sodium hydroxide that they use to chemistry correct. And then as the water leaves, you get these salt crystals forming. And then you have this sludge layer along the bottom, which is a lot of these heavier metallic elements that have dropped out of the solution. And it's about a peanut butter consistency. So different types of waste, different types of problems. It's estimated that across all of the tank farms, the total radioactivity totals up to about 146 million curies. Uh, what does that mean? How do you put that into context? Well, one curie of cesium-137, which is about half of the, the nuclides in the tank, one curie weighs about 12 milligrams, which is about half the size of a grain of rice. If you had that one curie about 20, uh, excuse me, one foot away from your arm, you would get a fatal dose of radiation within about 20 hours. If it was a centimeter away from you, fatal dose would be uh, within 20 minutes. So how close it is to you really matters. And that's just one curie. But that kind of exposure is not really a realistic way to think about how someone might be put in danger by these wastes. So let's instead think about what would happen if these were out in the environment, if they had escaped, if they traveled through the soil and entered the water. The drinking water standard for cesium-137 is 200 picocuries per liter of water. A picocurie is one trillionth of a curie. For strontium-90, which is another one of the main constituents of the tank waste, the drinking water standard is eight picocuries per liter. So the point here is a, a small bit can pose a significant health risk. And what we really are concerned about when it comes to radioactivity is the chance that it could cause cancer if, if uh, a person becomes exposed to it. Another important concept uh, to understand with this tank waste is that there are different constituents that have different half-lives. And a half-life is basically what it sounds like. It's the amount of time it takes for half of the radioactivity uh, to, to essentially burn down out of a, a particular um, constituent. So it's like a fire that's burning down at a predictable rate. And things like cesium and strontium, which make up most of the tank waste, have a relatively fast uh, burn rate. And so they have about a 30-year half-life. 
And there's an old rule of thumb that if you can get through 10 half-lives, that it, it virtually disappears. That falls apart when you have 100 million curies of something. Uh, however, it you know, gives you kind of a sense of how much time needs to pass. Um, but there are other constituents in the tank waste, technetium-99, for example, that moves really fast in the environment. It basically moves at the speed of water and it lasts for a really long time. So when you think about the management challenges of the waste inside these tanks, there are some significant problems over long timescales that have to be considered. The tanks also have a lot of non-radioactive constituents, uh, predominantly nitrate and sodium, and that comes from the nitric acid that they use to dissolve the waste and the sodium hydroxide that they use to then chemistry correct. There's also a fair amount of aluminum in there from the dissolved aluminum cans they had around the, the fuel itself, as well as many other uh, constituents. At one point I read there was an estimate that there were over 1500 different compounds in the tanks. There is so much complexity and so much variability in what's in each tank that no tank is the same. Um, I've heard it referred to as a witch's brew or a dog's breakfast, that there is just so much complexity that that really then complicates what you can do with the waste because there are so many potential interactions between the wastes themselves. Talk about some things that have happened to the tanks over the decades. Um, some tanks have overflowed, either intentionally or not. Um, and when they overflowed, they went into the environment, uh, leaked directly into the soil. It's estimated that around a million gallons of waste leaked directly from the tanks. Um, over time, uh, there were some events where there was buckling. So that, that trivet, that concrete base layer under the tank still has some residual moisture in it. And the tanks would get so hot that they would self boil. And that would then cause the water in the concrete to expand as steam. And there was actually a steam explosion in a few tanks where it would buckle the floor of the tank eight feet up and just tear through the steel liner. Big problem. Uh, you also had just corrosion, which would happen because of incompatible chemistry between the waste and the steel liner that protected it, um, as well as from the outer environment working its way in. You had some tanks that began to burp hydrogen, and that's because the water in the tanks would actually dissociate through what's called radiolysis into its constituent parts, namely hydrogen and oxygen. And if you had enough buildup in a tank, there was a concern there for a while that you could actually have a tank explode. Um, thankfully, we, we solved that problem over the years. All these problems you know, are, are not current problems. Um, and in 2004, all of the single shell tanks had any liquid that they could pump out removed. And that was under the philosophy that a dry tank won't leak. I think that that is mostly proven to be true um, with some, some possible exceptions there. And there is uh, an ongoing study right now to look at whether they can get even more moisture out of those tanks to dry them even further as an interim step. Um, again, to, to illustrate what would happen when a tank would overflow, these tanks were often built in cascades, which meant that you would have waste go into your first tank, fill it all the way up, and then it had an outlet where it would go into the next tank and it would fill it all the way up and then it would go to the next tank and it would fill all the way up. And if it filled that one up, well, there was an outlet that went to the environment. And one has to imagine they tried to avoid this situation from occurring, but there was also a high priority at the time to produce plutonium. And sometimes that meant that waste went directly into the environment. As a result, there are plumes of contamination under all of the tank farms at Hanford, all of the single shell tank farms rather. Um, many of those have reached groundwater and that's some of the plumes that Ken showed you in his presentation. Um, and some of them have are overlapping. And in some cases, there's still just contamination in the soil that for now has frozen in place. But over a long enough timeline, as more water from the natural environment comes in there and mobilizes that waste, water moves waste you know, there's going to be essentially a, a long tail to the potential problems uh, because of this waste that is trapped in the soil currently. So you can see there, we have these images of, of what's happened in the past there. So I've laid out some pretty big problems. Now I wanna talk about what we're doing about it. Uh, and it's in five easy steps, so here we go. Uh, first, and they're working on this now, 
to retrieve all of the waste out of the single shell tanks and into the double shell tanks to get that extra layer of protection. From there, the plan is to move waste out of the double shell tanks into what's called a waste treatment plant that is still currently under construction. And from there, it would convert the waste into glass logs that are more stable for long-term disposal. Once you've then emptied all the waste out of the tanks, you have to figure out how to perform final closure for those tanks, including occasionally some of the waste that's left behind that we just weren't able to get. Um, and to understand what risk we are potentially leaving behind in these tanks. There's then the next challenge of what do we do about the soil and groundwater that have experienced leaks and that currently have contamination? What's the plan? How, how much are we going to chase those? Or how do we ensure that people are protected in the long term? And that gets to the final point, long-term stewardship. For any of the risks that we leave behind, we need to make sure that somebody sticks around essentially forever to watch it and to make sure that no one is put under an undue risk. So step one, emptying out tank farms. Uh, one of the big problems is that there's about a, a foot wide uh, entry into a lot of these tanks. And so any equipment that you use to retrieve waste, you have to go through that one foot section. Um, they use multiple technologies to do this, but usually it involves spraying water and then sucking it back up. Uh, or using pressure washers or sluicing. Um, and, and occasionally they'll use chemicals then to dissolve waste as well. They've also developed some robots that can get into the tanks and push waste around and push it towards their vacuum pumps. Um, but again, they have to fit through a often a one foot hole. And so they made one called the fold track that actually would fold into a long thin uh, package that then they could lower into a tank. Uh, DOE, the Department of Energy has completed retrieval of their first tank farm uh, as of just a couple of years ago. Um, it took them 19 years to retrieve 16 tanks. And with 177 tanks total, you can do the math that this is a, a slow and difficult process and we need to figure out how to go faster. Here's an example of a tank retrieval that went really well. You can see there's a nice clean tank there. You can see the fold track right there in the middle. Here's an example of a retrieval that went less well or was more difficult. And you can see that sometimes some of this waste is just caked on to the sides or the bottom, kind of like a really old dirty dish. And it's difficult to get those last little bits out. Here's another example. And here's a little bit closer look at some of the waste that is sometimes left behind in these tanks after they retrieve them. And you can see that sometimes it even means it's, it's a loose waste. But part of the problem is because the bottom of these tanks are 50 feet down, it's hard to get a pump that can pull that material up to the ground surface to then take it somewhere else. And speaking of taking it somewhere else, once you've retrieved waste out of a tank, you then have to ship it across the site to get to one of the double shell tanks. And that involves sometimes miles and miles of transfer pipelines. So this is what that system is designed to look like as time goes on. But here's what it looks like today. There is still a lot of work ahead to build the infrastructure necessary to get this waste out of these tanks and where it needs to go, which is the waste treatment plant or the world's largest nuclear waste factory. It's going to produce two different products as currently envisioned. Uh, the high level waste canisters, those long skinny ones, uh, will have about 90% uh, of the radioactivity in 10% of the volume of the tank waste. Uh, and those short squat ones are going to have about 90% of the volume and 10% of the radioactivity. The high level waste canisters are, de are designated to go off site to a deep geologic repository, which does not yet exist in this country. And the low activity waste canisters, uh, after they've separated out the, the more highly radioactive stuff and split this tank waste into two different streams, that would then be disposed on site at Hanford. Um, unfortunately, the, the facility that they're building to, to treat that low activity waste is only sized to do about half of the waste that it needs to do. So we need to design the other half uh, still. Um, again, the plan is to turn this stuff into glass. And you may wonder, well, why glass? Why, why would you turn this radioactive waste into glass? And again, water moves waste. So if you think about a glass bottle, 
If you break it into a hundred pieces, it's still glass. And then if you put those hundred pieces into a bucket of water, it's still glass. So the idea is to trap the waste into a stable matrix so that it can withstand a very long time in the environment. This is a, an overhead view of the waste treatment plant. Uh, they began construction in 2002 after several starts and stops uh, dating back to 1989, I think. Um, and uh, those two buildings you can see on the right, the high level waste facility and the pretreatment facility, back in 2012, construction was halted on those facilities after it was discovered that there were some potentially serious design flaws that could cause uh, some major accidents. And the next video I'm going to The basic out. idea is to pump up and treat the groundwater, get the waste out of the tanks, and process it into glass logs. The first big problem is that radioactive waste can generate flammable gases, which can build up in the tanks and treatment facilities, and if ignited. On top of that, some of the waste in the tanks still contains plutonium, which is heavy. And as the waste is moved around, the plutonium could settle out, clump together, and start an uncontrolled chain reaction. That might not be such a big deal if workers could monitor and step in to prevent the accident. But the treatment process, at least for the most hazardous wastes, has to happen in special rooms, called black cells, that are too radioactive for humans to enter. According to the official plan, the machinery in those black cells has to work smoothly for 40 years with no direct human intervention. If something goes wrong, there would be little workers could do to prevent hazardous waste from spreading around the site. So that's bad news. Um, here's a picture of the, the black cells that were mentioned in that video. Uh, that video, by the way, is called uh, Why Hanford is the Cold War's Hot Mess. It's on YouTube. It's a really interesting video. There's more to it. I recommend you go check it out. Um, another problem that was not mentioned in the video is the idea of erosion and corrosion. All that aluminum is kind of the same stuff that you make sandpaper out of and in liquid form. If you have that running through your pipes over a 40 year period, which this plant is supposed to operate for 40 years, you can potentially have some problems there. So because of all these technical issues that were uh, revealed back in 2012, it was time for a new plan. And that plan is to, to forego the, the pretreatment facility, which is what splits the waste into two fractions and just do direct feed, low activity waste. The plan is to get that going within the next few years. And once they get started on treating the low activity stuff, which is 90% of the volume, then figure out what to do to finish up uh, the rest of the facilities and have them operational by 2036 is what's currently planned to then be able to have the full pretreatment or the full uh, waste treatment plant up and running. And then from there, like, like it was mentioned, it's a 40 year mission. Part of the, the new plan for direct feed low activity waste is to take some of the, the functions that that big pretreatment facility were going to perform and put it into a shipping container form factor. There has been the benefit of new technology development over time. And what you see there are uh, a treatment system that was used after the Fukushima accident in Japan that can essentially strip the cesium and astronium out of tank waste so that what's left is very lightly radioactive and and more suitable for this low activity waste. Now, now for some even bigger perspective, uh, Ken showed you uh, this figure in his presentation that there's a pretty wide range of what the total cost of the Hanford cleanup can be, as well as how long the cleanup can take. Um, the blue that you see in that figure is the part of the Hanford cleanup that is everything but tanks. And that red part is all the tank mission as I've described it so far. So it's the lion's share of the cost and the complexity of the Hanford cleanup. Um, some important things to see in this figure, the annual budget that is projected to be needed uh, tops out around $9 billion a year under the baseline scenario and has cleanup going until around 2080. However, under a worst case scenario, Cleanup will go out to 2100 or beyond, and your, your highest year would be up to $16 billion a year. And the problem is, our actual budget today 
is closer to about a billion and a half a year. So you can see that red line there. That's the total budget. And then there's the, the budget minus the construction costs for the waste treatment plant right now. We're going to run into a problem. Um, and really the, the biggest challenge of the tank mission in my mind is what you're looking at right now. But we need to add a ticking clock because things aren't complicated enough. Um, the double shell tanks have to be actively used over the entire 40 year mission of the tank waste treatment uh, effort. And that's because as soon as you empty waste out of a double shell tank and ship it off to the waste treatment plant, you are immediately filling it with waste that you just pulled out of a single shell tank. And so these double shell tanks are essentially performing, they're, they're the waste station and they're gonna be that way for 40 years. And so they have to survive that long. Um, when they were built, their design life ranged from 20 years to 50 years. And you can see that's the white portion of this figure. At the time the figure was created, they were projecting that the mission was gonna last an extra 18 to 20 years beyond their design lives. And the latest projections show going even farther beyond that. At the same time, back in 2012, we had our first double shell tank suffer a failure. AY-102 was discovered to have a leak. You can see that green waste along the bottom. There's another look at it and another. And it took some time for the state and DOE to come to an agreement that they were gonna empty the waste out of that tank. And here's what that looked like. It went from AY-102 to a different double shell tank, AP-102. And there was a bit of a dance that occurred of moving waste here and there and everywhere. And the process of emptying that one double shell tank took $100 million in two and a half years. And that was from one double shell tank failure. After they emptied the tank, they got some good looks at what it looked like inside. And this is what the bottom of that tank looked like. Uh, what they found was that there were multiple leaks, both along seams and in the center plate uh, caused by pitting corrosion from just incompatible waste chemistry and heat and time. This tank was 41 years into its 40 year design life at the time that it failed. There's another look at the pits in that tank. DOE has put a lot of effort into babying these double shell tanks because they know they need them to last a long time. So they've implemented a lot of different programs to, to perform corrosion control. They've invented little robots that can go into the slots between the two shells and use uh, ultrasonic testing to try to find weaknesses in the steel. Um, they're, they're doing as much as they can, but it's gonna be a big challenge as we go forward. And then step, whatever it was, three or four, what do you do with those tanks after you've emptied them? You know, one thought is we dig them out. Uh, the cost estimate for that was about $40 billion. And there are a lot of questions about how would you keep people safe while you are digging these giant holes in the desert that are highly radioactive? And then where would you put the waste after you dug it out? Uh, here's a conceptual drawing of what that might entail. Very complicated, very costly process, um, not without its own risk today that we would be undertaking to prevent potential risks in the future. So instead, DOE's preference uh, is to close the tanks in place after they've been emptied out. Uh, they would fill them with grout and cover them with a multi-layer cap because, again, water moves waste. And so the idea is if you can control water for long enough, then these tanks essentially become little time-release capsules that would very, very slowly, over time, release their contaminants. And if you can stay below your drinking water standard and if you can keep people out for the foreseeable future, then the argument goes that you have, you have maintained safety. But they have to perform for a period of 10,000 years. And there's a lot of uncertainty about how we are gonna be as a society. What language are we gonna speak? What government are we gonna have? You know, how are people going to, to, are we gonna even remember that this stuff is here? And so you have to then perform very complicated analyses and do the math and play these what if games um, of what would happen after tank closure. Uh, this is an example of some of the performance assessment modeling that DOE performs. And that's something that our agency does is to review these models for their technical accuracy. And then there's still that question of what are we going to do about the waste that's already in the environment? And frankly, that's not a problem we've solved yet. And it's not a decision that has been made and it will be made in the future. 
So to sum it all up, tank waste treatment is a long road ahead of us. And one of the big challenges is going to be fa managing a failing system as much it is, as it is going to be actually producing this more stable waste form. Um, those past tank leaks in soil are, are an unsolved problem. And whatever we decide with those tanks that, that stay in place, those decisions have to stand the test of time, a very long time. That's what I have, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, both Ken and Jeff. Um, so quickly, we have a few questions that have come in, um, but actually before we get into that, someone also wrote a comment, um, I believe it's a coworker, wanting to note that Ken specifically has been working for the Oregon Department of Energy for 31 years, and next week, Ken will be kicking off his well-earned retirement after 31 years. So how about a big virtual round of applause for three decades of service um, to Oregonians? That's awesome um, and congratulations. Thank you. Um, so we have a few questions here. Why don't we start off one that is for you, Ken, um, that came in during your presentation. So first off, thank you. As a family that has been separating our waste streams since 1970, we appreciate your work. I have a family that died of black lung disease. All energy is a source of injury and hurt. How do you see the future of energy in the US? When we flip the switch to turn on the lights, what will respond? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> Usually I get asked to look into the future about what's gonna happen with Hanford cleanup. I'm not quite sure that uh, our energy future um, you know, I could I could take a, a wild guess, but that's that's what it would be. Uh, it seems as though diversity in terms of energy production is a good thing uh, to have multiple different uh, things to rely on. Um, we were looking at it as an example. Just recently, I was going through some old documents and, and looking at the the history of nuclear power in the Pacific Northwest, and there was a big spur to push for it in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, and even the federal government was, was uh, and Congress said uh, coal and nuclear should be the future. And that obviously is flipped in 50 years. Um, coal is, is definitely has its issues. Nuclear does as well. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Renewables are doing great. There's a, there's a, um, one of my coworkers was interviewing me the other day just about the changes I've seen in 30 years at our agency. And going back 30 years, you know, we had Trojan uh, operating in Oregon. Our siding division was not siding uh, solar or wind. And now Trojan's long gone. Solar and wind are, are booming. Um, there's just just way too much that I don't know about energy to, to speculate any further. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, Jeff, a question that was specifically for you. Um, someone said, I teach high school chemistry in Corvallis, Oregon, and I'm planning to focus our atomic structure unit on nuclear processes and the Hanford cleanup. What would you, the presenters, want high school students to know as future scientists and members of the public, et cetera? Wow. Uh, that's a good question. You know, uh, there's just so much I interesting chemical history uh, as it relates to Hanford, um, how we learned the, the secrets of how uh, of radioactivity and how things transform, but then the great challenge of how to then separate out and get just the thing that you want. Um, we're dealing with that now where, you know, one of the big challenges at Hanford are these plumes of contaminants within the groundwater or even within the tank waste itself. 
you know, if we could find a way to remove the technetium and the iodine specifically from the tank waste, their long-term hazard would go down tremendously. The cost of the cleanup would go down exponentially. And all of a sudden, this almost insurmountable problem that we're looking at would become almost manageable. But the trick is, how do you find those right materials or those right processes? And a lot of times it does come down to the processes to, to then pull out those things that are your biggest concern or, those, or your biggest hazard. Um, and then there's this whole other side, which is, what is the, the process that is then going to be enacted on that waste that you've pulled out when you try to put it into a disposal context? Um, whether you bury it deep underground uh, in salt or in you know, some other granite formation or, or what have you, every time you, you then put it in a new situation, a new environment, immediately there are processes that begin to work on it. And it's only a matter of time. And so understanding this cause and effect and the way that these different constituents play in one another and then have real human impacts, I think it's just fascinating. All right, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, one more question that's specifically for Ken, um, that's a little more specific is, how many workers suffered from contamination? I don't think anyone can put a number on that. Um, you know, remarkably, we, we think about the, the radiation hazard at Hanford. It, it seems as though chemicals have been, uh, in many ways, a bigger health issue for a lot of the workers. Uh, they use, they widely use beryllium, which can cause uh, lung disease, uh, very serious lung disease. Uh, and it took a long time to, uh, to really turn that around in terms of recognition of the hazard to the workers there. Um, there are the tank farms that Jeff has talked about in great detail, that mix of chemicals in the tanks uh, there have been vapors in the tank farms that have harmed workers. Um, the radiation part in, in a lot of respects was a lot simpler for them to control. Um, I think at the same time, there were releases in the early days that they really weren't accounting for and really weren't um, checking the workers for. Um, so there have been a lot of hazards over the year. They're really all unquantifiable. Uh, unfortunately, the onus in many cases for, uh, for compensation and for medical help has been put in, in many cases on the worker. Um, if you have a very narrow focus of this effect, then maybe you can, you can be eligible. And that's, that's been unfortunate because a lot of workers have in fact suffered through the years. Thank you, Ken. Um, so a question that could be for both of you and you can decide who should answer. Um, what is the most challenging aspect of working with so many agencies and entities on the cleanup? The most challenging. <laughs> well, let me, let me start and Jeff can think about it and add in a little bit. Um, you know, the Hanford cleanup is really interesting in that you've got the U S department of energy, which is responsible for the cleanup. You've got, uh, a state regulator in the Washington Department of Ecology and a federal regu regulator in US EPA. You've got um, three Native American tribes, three recognized tribes and a fourth tribe that are very involved. You've got the adjacent state of Oregon. You've got uh, citizen groups and members of the public. So you have a, a whole lot of people that for the most part are, are really aiming towards the same goal. Um, and I think that there has been, when we, have, when we have realized the power in numbers, I think it has been we've been most successful. Um, but sometimes we don't always do that. As I mentioned earlier, the first 10 years or so, there was this, this fight over new missions, new production missions at Hanford. And what, was, what really should be a unified force towards cleanup was splintered a bit because there was strong entities pushing towards new missions while the rest of us were opposing that. So I think strength in numbers is a, is a, is a big deal and, and has been successful. Uh, 
Um, I guess I would just add that, you know, the cleanup has been going on for 30 years now. And when you have these institutions that have developed these firm positions over time, and then your situation changes, your understanding changes, our, our cumulative knowledge changes, it can sometimes be difficult to step outside those positions and get back to what are our real interests around the table with the Hanford cleanup? And is there a way that we can open new opportunities, new possibilities? How do we ever change a position? How do we ever become less concerned about something that we were concerned about once before or vice versa. Um, and within that, I think one of the great challenges is, is understanding people's different perceptions of risk, how people think about it, how people measure what's important to them, um, the, the information that, that each entity is willing to trust and what their standards for when knowledge is good enough, I think those are often some of the bigger challenges for how to make actual decisions at Hanford. Okay, thank you both Ken and Jeff. So someone commented, this is why I'm so angry anytime someone claims nuclear energy is cheap. It isn't cheap when you factor in the costs of dealing with the waste. So in that vein, how did the industry ever convince the government waste wasn't part of the expense of using nuclear energy. Hmm. Well, let me let me say that, first of all, Hanford is really not about nuclear power. Hanford was about nuclear weapons. And although they did generate some power, the, the ways in which they created their mess was a whole lot different than nuclear power. That's not to say there isn't a waste problem in, in nuclear power. There is. There is no current solution. Um, in terms of how they've convinced the federal government to, I guess, overlook that, uh, I mean, that, that goes way back in history with, uh, with a lot of claims and expectations for nuclear that, that just haven't borne true. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, is anyone working on changing the molecular structure of the waste or creating a virus or worm that can alter the makeup of radioactive materials? <laughs> oh, that's a fun one. Um, well, you know, there, there have been news articles that you'll see from time to time about, you know, a fungus at Chernobyl that eats radiation. Or there are um, bioremediation strategies where if you plant a tree, whose roots can get where the waste is, it can actually pull the contamination up. It's like a tree because you aren't actually destroying the constituent. You're just changing its location. Um, and that's what Ken was talking about earlier, about how you can't really destroy the radioactivity of the waste, except maybe in a linear accelerator. Um, but putting this really complex waste through that kind of process you know, maybe I read something a while back about using plasma, but you know, I, I don't know. I think really what we focus on is how to separate the parts of the waste that are going to be the long-term and the mobile hazards that can actually uh, be an exposure risk to humans and then isolating those and just getting them to a place and a, and a context within disposal, both a waste form and a waste location and you know the, the whole package there so that you just separate it from humankind okay thank you um another question has the general public in the surrounding area seen an increased incidence of cancers so <clears throat> i would say that that I would say that they probably have, but again, it's not quantifiable. Um, the way that Hanford operated in its early days uh, in the in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, they, they emitted huge amounts of radioactive materials into the atmosphere and even larger amounts into the Columbia River. 
there was a, a thyroid disease study that was conducted through the 1990s. And they looked at thyroid disease because the predominant radioisotope that was released to the air, iodine 131, does impact a, a person's thyroid. They did not find in that epidemiological study a conclusive cause and effect. Uh, but when you just look at the doses that people might have received, and there was also a decade long project to recreate and estimate those doses. When you look at the doses that people uh, would have received, uh, Native Americans, especially for eating a lot of fish out of the Columbia River, uh, even though you can't necessarily draw that definitive medical conclusion, it seems that yes, there were people that were impacted by Anford's early operations. I, I, don't, I have no doubt there was. Okay, thank you. Um, so it looks like we just have one more question. Um, so if anyone out there does wanna add something, now is the time. Um, so one of the final questions is, is the role of the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board expected to continue throughout the entire Hanford cleanup? Why don't you tackle that, Jeff? <laughs> the well, time won't be around much longer. <laughs> my, my understanding of the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board is that it is a governor appointed board. Um, we actually serve the as staff to the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board. My expectation is that as long as the cleanup is going on, which decades to come, there needs to be an Oregon presence, um, an Oregon voice that will be able to, to watch what's going on and to provide our perspective to ensure that the decisions being made don't neglect the needs of Oregon and the Columbia River. And so I think as long as people are still interested in showing up to those meetings, that board will continue, which shameless plug, you know, we're always looking for people who are interested in Hanford and who may be interested in joining the board in the future. So if you're out there and this kind of stuff animates you, please reach out to us and, uh, and let's get to know one another. Thanks. And one more came in. Um, is the cleanup the most expensive cost of World War II? Hmm. I have no idea. You know, once upon a time, I, I looked at what the cost of the Manhattan Project was at the time. And I want to say that it was something like $2 billion in, in 1940s dollars, which would be, you know, 10 times that much today. So yeah, the, the cleanup far eclipses that. But what I don't know is all the other mobilization of this entire country over those years. <sighs> I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Great. Well, I think that is all that we have for this evening. So um, Ken and Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Um, and to everyone else out there, I hope you enjoyed tonight's event. If you would like to watch this video again or share it with friends, check out the videos section on the OMSI's Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates of future events and inspiring content from OMSI. And I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but please consider supporting Science Pub and making a donation via the Facebook donate button, or you can visit omsi.edu slash donate. Join us next week on Tuesday, September 1st for a lecture on the beautiful geology of national parks of the Pacific Northwest by Dr. Scott Burns. He will explore six national parks, including Rainier, Crater Lake, Mount Lassen, Redwoods, Olympic, and North Cascades. Once again, thanks to our partner, Celestream, for helping make tonight's event possible. And as always, you can get more information on our website at omsi.edu. Thanks again, and have a good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.